our Lord. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let's pray. Father, when we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, we're amazed that you would ever think about us. We're amazed that you would desire to show yourself and reveal your love to us. We're amazed that you would ever want our love. Father, what a privilege and what a blessing it is to know you, to serve you, and to experience, Lord, your presence and your power in our lives. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Bless now, we pray, Lord, the study of the word. Open our minds and hearts to receive from you this day. Help, strength, comfort, courage. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This week, Joshua chapters 10 through 12. And again, we encourage you to read the whole Bible. Read it all the way through. Join with us as we go through it together. Tonight we'll be studying Joshua 10 through 12 as we go through the whole Bible. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to the 10th chapter and beginning with verse 12. Here we read, Then spake Joshua to the Lord, in the day which the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down for about a whole day. Last week in our study, we saw how that Joshua and the men of Israel got into great trouble because they didn't stop to inquire of God. They just looked at what seemed to be very obvious. And thus they were deceived by the men of Gideon because they took of their victuals and didn't inquire of the Lord. And thus they were brought into an ungodly alliance that God had actually forbidden. Now we see how quickly this alliance gets them in trouble. When the kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem and four others, had heard that the Gibeonites had made a treaty with Joshua, they were angry with Gibeon because it was one of the greatest cities and they were counting on it to repel the invasion of Israel. And when they found that the people of Gib Gibeon instead had made a treaty they were angered, and they decided that they would join their forces to come against Gibeon and to punish it and to destroy it because they dared to make a union, a treaty with Joshua and Israel. And so as the armies of the Amorites came against Gibeon and began to besiege the city, the people of Gibeon sent a message down to Joshua, who was in Gilgal, saying, we are being attacked. Come and help us. It was a part of the treaty. 
And so Joshua is now forced, because of the treaty, to come with the men of war to help defend the Gibeonites from the attack by the armies of these five kings of the Amorites. Ungodly alliances have a way of getting us into trouble. The yoke with an unbeliever is always an unequal yoke because you are playing by different set of rules. You believe in honesty. They feel free to tell a lie. You believe in integrity. It doesn't bother them to cheat. You believe in keeping your promises. They don't mind if they break their promise. You feel bound to do that which is right and fair. They don't care if it's wrong. It's always an unequal yoke with the unbeliever. I believe that had Joshua called on the Gibeonites to help them, that they would not have responded. They would have said, well, that's tough. They maybe even would have joined with the enemies if they thought the enemies could destroy Israel. The Bible tells us that it's really not necessary to make a vow, but that if you do make a vow, then you should keep it. Jesus said, let your yes be a yes, let your no be a no. Be a person of integrity. Be a person of your word. Don't be the kind of person that has to swear that you are telling the truth. Just tell the truth. So Joshua and his men came from Gilgal up to Gibeon to help them to defend themselves against this attack by the Amorites. As Joshua and his men were on the way up the hill to Gibeon, the Lord spoke to Joshua words of encouragement, words of comfort, assurance. I love it how that when we are facing problems, the Lord so often comes and speaks words of assurance to us. Even as with Joshua, the Lord said, fear not. As you're facing the battles today, God is saying to you, don't be afraid, I'm with you. There's a time in the history of the nation of Israel, when the Syrian king planned terrorist attacks against Israel, he ordered his troops to lay wait in certain valleys to ambush the Israelis as they came through. Every time he would devise a plan to terrorize and to ambush the Israelis, the prophet Elisha would go to the king of Israel and he would say, now avoid this valley. The Syrians are waiting in the valley to ambush you. And so the Israelis would avoid that valley. This happened not once, but over and over again. So many times, that the king of Syria called his generals together, and he said, one of you is a friend of our enemy because every time we're planning some kind of a sortie, they're ready, they're waiting, they know what we're doing. And that could not be unless one of you were leaking information to them, you're a friend of our enemy. They said, not so, king. 
But there is a prophet in Israel that every time you devise a plot, he knows all about it. And he goes and informs the king. In fact, you can't even talk to your wife in bed at night, but what he doesn't know what you're saying to her. He said, capture him. Send out spies, find out where he is. And they said, he is dwelling in Dothan. The king said, take the city. So the Syrians by night came with their army and surrounded the city of Dothan where Elisha was staying. In the morning, when his servant rose up early to go out and chop wood for the fire, he looked up and he saw the Syrian army, their chariots, their horses surrounding the city of Dothan. He went running in excitedly. He woke up the prophet and he said, Alas, alas, we've had it. We're surrounded by the Syrians. And the prophet Elisha said to him, Those that are with us are more than those that are with them. And then he prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see what's really happening. And he went out again and he looked and behold, now he saw the angels of the Lord surrounding the Syrian army. He sees the truth, the realm of the spirit. And you know, our problem is that we don't always see that realm. We see only the natural realm. We see things from the natural standpoint and we fail to take into consideration the spiritual standpoint, the divine standpoint. Looking at it from our standpoint, it looks impossible. Looking at it from God's standpoint, there's nothing to it. Looking at it from our standpoint, we cry, alas, alas, we've had it. But when we can see it from God's standpoint, we say, alas, alas, they've had it. <laughs> what a difference when you can see things from the divine perspective. As Peter said, that they're short-sighted. They can't see that which is far off. As Paul said, we don't look at the things which are seen because they're temporal, but the things which are not seen because they are eternal. And so we have the promise of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, for the Lord will deliver the Amorite kings into your hand, that they would not be able to stand before you. Don't be afraid. I'll deliver them into your hand they won't be able to stand before you. Strengthened by these assurances, Joshua led the men of Israel into the battle. And they enter into the battle with confidence, confident of the victory because of the promises of God. As we enter into the spiritual battles, we can enter in with confidence of victory because our Lord Jesus Christ has already fought the battle and has been victorious. Paul, writing to the Colossians, said, and he has spoiled those principalities and powers that are opposed to us, making an open display of his victory as he triumphed over them through his cross. The victory is ours we enter into the battle confident because the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, has gone before us and has brought to us the glorious victory. The Amorites began to flee from Joshua and the men of Israel. And the Lord began to fight with Joshua against them and it says, he sent great hailstones 
at them. And more men were killed by the hailstones than were killed by Joshua's men. We often read of hailstorms in the Midwest or Texas because everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> hailstones that are golf ball sizes or hailstones that are the size of baseballs. Hard to imagine hailstones that big. Hard to imagine the pain and damage they could do. A few years ago, I was in Colorado Springs at Fort Collins, and I was addressing our servicemen in the armory division there. And they were standing there on the field, and I was sharing with them from God's Word. When this dark cloud came over, and it began to hail, not the size of golf balls, but the size of large marbles. My message was abruptly interrupted as we all headed for the tanks and the armored uh, cars and so forth, jumping in to get free from these huge hailstones that were falling. I got hit by a couple, really stung. And as we sat there in these armored vehicles, we heard the hailstones just clanging on the metal above us. Looking out, we could see how that they were falling on the ground, and within just a few moments, there were about six inches high hailstones on the ground. And I could imagine what hailstones the size of a baseball could do. It is interesting, the Bible speaks of in the future, the great tribulation, when God is judging the earth, he's going to send hailstones of about 90 pounds in weight. Can you imagine the damage they would do? You see, God can make hailstones of any size. And God sent these hailstones against the army of the Amorites, and more men were killed by the hailstones than were killed by Joshua as they were fleeing from the men of Israel. The storm passed. The enemy was in a rout. And Joshua realized, because it was now in the afternoon, we need more time if we're going to utterly destroy them. Before long, it will be dark, and uh, we won't be able to continue to pursue them. And so realizing that they needed more daylight to complete the victory over the Amorite kings, Joshua, in the ears of the people, said, Son! Stand still over Gibeon. Moon, you stay there in the valley of Agilon. And the amazing thing was, the sun stood still and didn't go down for the space of about a day. This particular part of the story creates trouble for a lot of people. It causes them to stumble. But if you have a hard time believing this story, if you say, oh, I can't believe that, then the problem is with your concept of God. Your God is not big enough. You need to have a right concept of God. If, as we read this morning in Psalm 8, if the heavens are the work of his fingers, he's ordained the moon and the stars, then why would it be difficult for him to stop the earth in its spinning on its axis for a short time and then 
give it a twist, and let it spin again. <laughs> Shouldn't it be hard for a God who stretched forth the heavens as a curtain? Shouldn't it be hard for a God who brought into existence the entire universe, who flung the stars out into space from his fingertips to slow and to stop the earth for a short while should not be a difficult thing for him. It is interesting how man is always trying to develop some natural way by which God could have performed the miracles. And we look for a naturalistic explanation. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish and had food left over, how could that be? Well, you see, in those days, according to the theologians, people wore these robes with long sleeves, and they had little uh, strings tied around the wrist. And in the sleeves, they would often carry their lunch. And when the people were out there and needing food, all of those selfish people would not share their food. But one little boy came up to Jesus, and he said, well, you can have my five loaves and two fish. And everybody was so touched and moved by the generosity of this little boy. They all untied their sleeves, pulled out the food, and shared it with each other, and they had food left over. Isn't that wonderful? The example of the little boy, how it can touch the hearts of so many people. And so you draw your uh, little uh, analogy from this. When the disciples were out on the ship, in the storm, and they saw Jesus coming to them, walking on the water. What they didn't realize is that the storm blew them off course, and they were right next to the shore. But because it was sort of foggy, and they saw Jesus walking along the shore, it looked like he was walking on the water because the waves are so boisterous and all. But in reality, he was walking on the beach. <laughs> so no miracle. When the Red Sea was parted and the children of Israel were able to walk through, escaping from the Egyptians. Well, really, the Red Sea is a bad translation. It is really the Sea of Reeds, which is a marsh. And the water is only about 18 inches deep. And so it was no problem for them to, you know, make it through the marsh and escape the Egyptians. But it's interesting when you start trying to figure things out, you run into another problem. How in the world did the whole Egyptian army drown in 18 inches of water? <laughs> you haven't solved the problem, you've just created a new one. When the Jordan River stopped so that Joshua and the people were able to cross during flood season on dry ground, well, you see, that area is prone to earthquakes. And up north, uh, near where the Jabbok comes into the Jordan, there are these steep cliffs, dirt cliffs, and where the Jordan winds down, and there's steep cliffs. And there was an earthquake, and it caused a landslide which blocked the Jordan River. And thus, the river stopped flowing from the north, and they were able to cross. And of course, ultimately, the earth dam gave way, and the river came flowing again. Uh, but uh, it was just an earthquake. And when the walls of Jericho fell, uh, when they were sounding the trumpets after the seventh time around on the seventh day, well, you see, it was probably an aftershock of the first earthquake, and it brought the walls down. But when you get to the sun standing still, you've got a problem. <laughs> There's no natural kind of explanation for this miracle. The sun stood still over Gibeon. Well, you say, that's ridiculous. 
If the earth would suddenly stop spinning on its axis, we would all be moving and the momentum of the earth at a thousand miles an hour, and we would all be thrown clear across MacArthur Boulevard. <laughs> Just like if you're in a car and you're going 60 miles an hour and, and you hit a block wall, your body is still going 60 miles an hour though the car has been stopped by the block wall, and you keep going at 60 miles an hour until you hit the dashboard. But you see, if the earth would stop suddenly like that, we'd all be, you know, from 1,000 miles an hour, just boom, you'd all be thrown off the earth. Don't you suppose God has enough sense to use the brakes? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't say that it stopped suddenly. Maybe over a 20-minute period of time, God just sort of slowed the thing down until he finally stopped it. And here was the sun still hanging over Gibeon. And here was the moon still hanging over the Valley of Agilon until Joshua was able to get complete victory over the enemy. You say, well, if such a thing would ever happen, it would surely show up in the annals of, of other people around the world. I'm glad you thought about that. <laughs> because when Columbus came to America and Cortez, they found that the people over here, many of them were very literate. They had books. They did have a writing and did have books. Unfortunately, most of their writings were destroyed by the Dominican monks in the 16th century. But a few of them were preserved and are today in the libraries of per Paris and the Vatican. They're called the Codice. In these annals, the annals known as the Cuhatitlan, they have the record of the history of the empire of uh, Culhuacan and of Mexico. And they tell how in the remote past there was a night that did not end for a long time. Now you see, being a halfway around the world, if the sun would stand still over Gibeon, it would mean that it wouldn't come up over here so that you would have a very long night over here. In the Mexican annals, it says that the earth was deprived of the sun for a fourfold night. In the Midrashim, the book of ancient traditions, it speaks of the sun and the moon standing still for 36 item which would be about 18 hours. And around the world, in folklore and in stories and in legends, you can find the stories of the long evening, the long morning, and you can trace it around the world in the annals, the ancient annals of the different ethnic groups. Over here in the Western Hemisphere. The Indians probably wondered why the sun had not come up. Why is it still dark? Little did they know that over in Israel, Joshua had said, Sun, stand still over Gibeon. Moon, hang there in the valley of Agilon in order that God might give them time for complete victory. Jesus said, I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he say it. You mean you could actually move a mountain into the sea 
Jesus said so. Imagine the power of God to stop the rotation of the earth on its axis and then to be able to start it up again. Imagine the power of God that is available to that man who is fully in touch with God. Here is Joshua commanding the sun and the moon, and they follow his injunction. I take great delight in knowing the power of God. I take great delight in knowing the extent that God is willing to go to help me. The Bible often uses the argument from the lesser to the greater. And then it uses the argument from the greater to the lesser. One of the arguments of the greater to the lesser is given by Paul in Romans chapter 8, where he said, If God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how much more then shall he not freely give us all things? You see, the greater has already been given. God to show his love, God to show his concern, God to show his desire to have fellowship with you, gave his only begotten son. Whatever your need is today is totally insignificant in the light of what God has already demonstrated his willingness to do to help you, to save you, to make you his child. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up. How much more then shall he not freely give us all things? God is wanting to help you today. God is willing to help you today. And God is able to help you today. For he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. And the amazing thing to me is that he really desires to do for me and to do for you, to help us, to help us in the battles of life that we face, in the problems and the difficulties that we have. And so often it's just as James said, you have not because you ask not. Just that simple. God waiting, waiting to help. I'm sure the angels who are watching us are probably sometimes amused, but many times in shock. As they see all of the mental contortions that we go through, we, they see our frustrations. They see our despair. They, they look on us and they, they watch us as we are just, you know, going to pieces. And I'm sure they turn to each other and they shake their heads and they say, those crazy fools, why don't they pray? Knowing the power that's available to us that God wants to demonstrate they're probably amazed at how we just struggle and go through all of these things when help is just a prayer away. Just turning to God. He's there. Not only is he there. Power more than sufficient to handle our little problems. What seem like mountains to us are nothing to God. It's all in the perspective in which you look at it. We travel around the world. We see the Andes. We see the Rocky Mountains. We see the Himalayas. 
And, and there in the Himalayas, you know, rising up some 19,000 feet. And what a tall mountain. Whoa, you know. Well, do you know that if the earth was reduced to the size of a bowling ball, that the valleys and the Himalayas would have less of a variance than the lacquer on the bowling ball. It would seem to be absolutely smooth if it was reduced to the size of a bowling ball. You wouldn't really be able to notice the high mountains. So with our problems, they look so high, so tall. Now that's because you're looking from this perspective. If you're looking from God's perspective, you have to <laughs> get out the, you know, the microscope to, to see them. He said, behold, I'm God. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. There's nothing too hard for God. If you'll just learn to cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do care for us. We thank you that you desire to bear our burdens and have promised to do so. We thank you, Lord, that you will give us victory in our battles, you've promised to do so. We promise, Lord, that we thank you, Lord, that you've promised that you would be with us in the darkest hours, and that you are there, there to comfort, there to help, there to deliver. Lord, there are people today going through some pretty deep valleys. They can't seem to see any way out. But Lord, we know that you are able to make a way where there is no way. You're able to stop the rotation of the earth to help your servants. And Lord, our, our needs are so infinitesimal compared to that. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to call upon you. Help us to turn to you. Lord, you said that we ought always to pray and not to faint. So help us, Lord, not to faint, but to turn to you and find your strength and your help in our hour of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? God wants to help you today. God is able to help you today, no matter how impossible the situation looks, how high the mountain seems to be, how huge the problem, how impossible the situation. God is able to stop the earth, if necessary, to help you. I would encourage you today, if you're facing some of those dilemmas that we often face in life, problems that you really don't know quite how you're going to deal with it, you're over your head, you need help, the Lord is there to help you. I would encourage you, as soon as we're dismissed, make your way forward. These men down here at the front are servants of God. And they are here to minister and to serve your spiritual needs, to pray for you, to pray with you, that you might find the help of God and the answers from God for the situations, the problems that you are facing in your life. God wants to help you. God will help you. All you have to do is call. The Lord bless thee, God bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord make 
his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee the lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and now on behalf of the word for today the broadcast ministry of pastor chuck smith we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast for more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact The Word for Today at The Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589. Or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.